Welcome to the Hawkcast with your host, AJ Hawk. All right, here we go, Boss Root. I love it. For the audio listeners, Boss has a nice, a nice stogie he's smoking. Are you in your are you in your backyard or where are you? I'm in my backyard, yeah. We uh, you know, I have this house and it's it's not big, and the backyard is not big, but it's perfect. It's got everything. It's got a pool, it's got a jacuzzi, it's got the barbecue, it's got an over over top thing here, it's got a TV outside, a fireplace, you know, so I'm I'm sitting outside smoking cigars and uh, doing interviews. I love it, man. I love it. You're uh, you're in California now. You come originally from Holland. When did you come over to the U.S. for good? Uh, it was in uh, in '95. I made my first trip here. I was teaching at the, the L.A. Uh, PD, and that's it was in October. I was sitting on the beach drinking a tequila shot with a Heineken at three o'clock in the afternoon, and I called my wife because in Holland at that moment they're skating on lakes. <laughs> it's that cold. <laughs> And I said, I'm on the beach right now. I'm not wearing a shirt. I'm drinking a tequila shot. And I had to get, start packing. We're going to move here. Wow. And was that's, it? That's what we did in 97. 90, okay. So you spent a good, a good chunk of time over there. Was that ever, was that always in the back of your mind that you would eventually come to America? You know, it, it, it was really weird. Is when I was a kid, I made this, this drawing and a, a story about Nogi, Nogi the bird. And Nogi the bird, I, I think I was probably seven, eight years old. Nogi the bird went to America. He went to America to visit the people over there. And uh, I guess it was the seed was planted there. I also had a Buick. I had a big Dodge pickup truck with big wheels. You know, I, I, I loved American products already when I, uh, when I was young. Wow. So what, what is their view over there on Americans? Do they, do they look at all of us as like spoiled silver spoons or what do they think of us? Yeah, exactly what you're saying. And we're a dumb, uh, bunch of dumb people. And you know, the the the, the thing they all said with uh, with Bush, President Bush, they said, "Oh, he's a he's a cowboy." And I go, "Nah, no, he's not. He's born in Cincinnati, so he's not a cowboy." So what is your next thing? And then they literally go, like, "Oh, uh, uh, I don't, I don't know." They just repeat what everybody says. Every single person you talk to, if you talk about Bush, they will say, "Oh, he's just a cowboy." And all the people in California are fake because they all ask you, "How are you doing?" I go, "Hmm." In Holland, we say, "Who got it?" That means actually, "How are you doing?" It's exactly the same word. So I don't know what goes on, but um. I give you an example. My parents didn't want to visit us because they were afraid of America. Because they watched the movies, they think it's the Wild West, and everybody starts shooting each other. And uh, once they made the trip, the next trip that was a two-week trip. The next trip when they came back was three months. They went to Seattle, got an RV, and they traveled throughout whole America. It's their favorite country, favorite people. They love it here. <laughs> so, are, are they still are they still alive? Yeah, they're still alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one of those things that if you come, everybody like in Holland or in Europe, they talk bad about it. But once they visit, they go, oh, man, this is absolutely not what I thought. And it's uh, it's really weird. That's what I always say. I say, have you been there? No. I say, why don't you visit first? And then you talk about it. Just see what you think, because it will change your mind. And it will really do, because it's a, it's a great country. Yeah, I, I mean, this is, all, this is all I know. I'm actually leaving here uh, tomorrow to head over to London. And as at the time of us recording this, they had some... The attacks with a guy, I guess, drove his car into some people and tried to to run into Parliament with a knife. So I, I don't know. It's going to be a bit sketchy. I've been I've been watching some of your YouTube clips so I can help out my kids if I have an issue. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're not going to need it. I don't. Uh, you know, it's always uh, when uh, when an airline crashes. You know, that particular airline is probably the safest airline to fly with at that moment because the chance that it happens twice in a row. I don't think there's a big chance. I think we will see something else somewhere somewhere else in Europe. Oh, no doubt. That's so pivoting quickly. It's something that I I recently stumbled upon after I I solidified that I was going to be talking to you. I've seen all your videos and the, the bar fight videos, which I used to show my my daughter's six now. I'd say when she was three, I used to show her the one one of your your most famous ones when you're talking about how to win a bar fight. Basically, boom, kick to the groin, that whole situation, which yeah. is my favorite. She loves it, and she wouldn't even understand what's going on now. My four year old son just runs around and throws punches that he he watches boss throw on a uh, YouTube. But something I I found was when you were doing. I love listening to you do commentary on your old fights. Are you? Did you do every one of them? I did every single one of them. You know, I did a very smart thing. I, I was already thinking about the future. So when I had my last contract, they wanted me back. I first of all, I beat my last the last opponent. They gave me that the, the opponent I lost from uh, before in my my first loss 
for Funaki Mazakatsu. And they were waiting till the end of my contract. And then he gave, they gave him to me again because they figured he's going to beat him. Uh, Funaki's going to beat me, and they will be help, helping them with the with the negotiation uh, for the new contract. But it didn't work out that way. I knocked him out. So that now I had the power in the hand. That's why I, I I wanted that. And one of my things in the contract was I said I want you I, I want all the the footage to my fights. I want every single fight so I can sell it. I want to put that in contract. And they did. You know. So uh, I was fortunate to get all my fights put them on tape for all the people and do my own commentary. Oh, listen to you do the commentary. You bring it. It's crazy how you're so open and honest about, I think your first fight, you're like, Oh, look at my shorts, man. Everybody's got to learn. You were wearing those. What are those? Like some tie fighting shorts or what, what were those? Yeah, those were my lucky shorts. They were dark purple, purple <laughs> when I started competing in Thai boxing, but they became pink and then they became all ripped up. And after the second show, they gave me, you know, this was their way of saying, Please wear this. They gave me this whole new outfit. I believe it was that red outfit that I was wearing. Red shin guards and the red shorts. It was a present from Pancras, meaning please wear this. Don't wear that anymore. For people that don't know about Pancras, which I, I, I love like the whole fight game, so I've been aware of it for a while. Like, can you explain the differences between that and the, like, the current MMA UFC that's going on now? Well, first of all, there were no rounds and there was no weight classes. That was the first thing. Uh, I found out on the day of the event, actually. No weight classes. I fought a guy 245. I was 205. I go, like, oh, there's no weight class? No. How, so how many rounds do we have? They said one round. So I'm all happy. I go, that's great. How many minutes? 30. I go, oh, great. You know, but afterwards, <laughs> when I took my manager to the side, I go, dude, what did you get me into? You know, 30-minute fights, guys 40 pounds heavier than I am. It's, uh, it's a problem. But... Um, Okay, so sorry, I I, I still no, just like the, maybe the rule, like the the differences in oh, the, the rules, rules yeah. yeah. So the the rule, the difference was we had open hand strikes to the face. You know, those rules were kind of developed for 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 the Japanese fighters. The Japanese fighters are known for be, being really good ground fighters, not as much as great strikers. So what they said is, okay, let's let's put them, give them shoes on, let's put the shin guards that will damp the the, the kicks. Open hands, that's going to be easier for us, of course, for, for submissions as well, because if you have to wear a thick glove, go for a rear naked, it's much harder than going without. Shoes is great for leg locks. Hey, coincidentally, all the Japanese people, they're, uh, they're leg lock specialists, and they had this rope escape, and the rope escapes are, uh, I, I really liked. It's almost like pro wrestling, of course, but it's but it's real. But what happens is that, for instance, if you get somebody in a, in a, in a rear naked choke, but this person is close to the rope and he can put his hand or his foot on the rope, I'm going to have to let him go. Now that he gets eight, a point deducted, the same as an eight count. So after the fight, if he, if he didn't finish the guy after that, after the fight, they're going to see who, who had the most point deductions, and that person was going to lose. Now, so the trick for me was always to just to make sure that I never used the rope escape. So so make it for me so that it felt like a real fight for me. Now, the great thing that comes from it is, for instance, in, uh, in a fight, my first fight was a guy, I knocked him out in 43 seconds. Then the second time I fought him, it was 28 minutes. But the, the example I gave is because then now you can see with those rules, what you can do. The first punch I gave him in the rematch, I break my hand, I break this hand. So my hand was hurt and I, I kind of couldn't strike anymore, so I, I went for grappling. I submitted him five times. So I submitted him, but then he could touch the rope. I had to let him go, but you start back on your feet and then you fight again. So what happens is, if you look at my record, I believe I have 14 submission victories and 12 knockouts, but those 14 submission victories uh, the UFC Hall of uh, Fame stats, they were out one time, and they counted all the other ones. It's like 45. So officially, I submitted 45 people. It's, uh, of course, it's less people uh, less people because I su would submit the same person in one fight, but you get more ring time. And that's why I believe that all these fighters from Pankers in the early days, if you look at Ken Shamrock, he became UFC champion. Frank Shamrock became a five-time UFC champion. Mari Smith became a UFC champion. I mean... Uh, Takahashi, he fought really good. He was he's from the UFC. Guy Metzger was a, the the four man tournament UFC champion. They were all from Pancras, and I believe it's truly because we had more ring time. You have a submission, he gets a rope, you get back up. You also become more strategical because now if you get somebody in a rear naked choke or you want to go for a choke, you want to make sure first that he's in the center of the ring so he cannot touch the rope. Then again, if you're in the center of the ring and he reverses you. Now you're in, problem, in, a, in trouble, you see what I mean? So the whole way of thinking was a different way of thinking, but it applied really well to mixed martial arts, what it became later. 
it, it did what's what's crazy i think for people to see is when you were fighting pancreas you guys have those those big shin guards and you're wearing shoes and that just looks like pro wrestling to people now yep. i guess that are just stumbling upon it and to see all like the leg locks and ankle lock all the stuff you guys are going for on their feet seems like the biggest thing you have to worry about is that is that true yeah, that's true. It's uh, the leg locks was uh, it was a bad thing in the in the beginning because what happened was all these inverted heel hooks started happening and people start getting injured. Then I I had an, uh, the day before the fight we're walking through Tokyo and we hear suddenly we hear hybrid wrestling pancreas this announcing voice and we look on a wall and there's this giant screen like in the, the the biggest screen I've ever seen in the entire wall and the first thing we see is me knocking somebody out so it's a preview for our show, which is going to take place the next day. And I see this guy sitting in a half guard, and the leg is over, and he grabs the heel, he falls back, and the guy taps with it's an inverted heel hook. So I look at uh, John Blooming, who is the highest decorated Kyokushin fighter uh, besides Mazuyama, who started Kyokushin, and he's from Holland, and I look at him, I go, oh, that's a cool move, I should remember that, you never know if it comes in handy. So the next day I'm fighting, and I'm in that position, and I think, hey, might as well try it. So I slapped it on, but since I never did it before, I had no clue how much pressure I would put on this guy's leg. So I grabbed it, I fell back, and I snapped his shin bone in half. So now this happened. Then right after another show, somebody else Niga talked up again, and that's when Pankro said, you know what, let's not do inverted heel hooks anymore because we're not keeping anybody in our fight roster. Everybody's getting injured. And that's when they took the inverted heel hook out. The normal one stayed in, but the inverted heel hook went out until I came up with an exactly the same move but I would not hook the heel. What I would do, I would grab the heel and I would push the toe. It's exactly the same mechanics, but I'm not hooking the heel. So they couldn't say to me it was a heel hook. <laughs> it was more of a heel pull and a toe push. And then I injured somebody else again, but they, didn't, they never made a rule for that. Now, once I left Pancras, they went back to all normal fights. And what they also did is no more shoes yeah. and closed fist. Yeah. That was the worst thing for me. I mean, I left Pancras three months later. They did closed fists and no more shin protection. I go, are you kidding? I left, and then three months later, you do that. So it was a shame, but uh, I loved it. I, I love Pancras. It was a great organization. So when you – that no closed fist to the face, correct? Could you, you could close your fist and punch to the body like your, your patented liver shot, right? Yes, everything, knees to the head, kicks to the head. Everything was legal for the rest. It was just – no, no close fist strikes to the head. Okay, and and that's one. So it's one thirty minute round, and then bam, that's it. That's it. And then later on, because a lot of these fights they became they became long fights. So sometimes you had an event that was six hours. So they realized, okay, we got to do something. So what they started to do is pretty much what they're doing right now. They made like normal fights fifteen minutes or twenty. I think they believe it. It started with twenty minutes. That went later back to fifteen, and then the the main events were thirty minutes. So they, they, they made it a little shorter, more could, exciting for the, uh, for the fans. Could you ever see uh, like the current MMA structure switching to that instead of these you know, three five-minute rounds and title fights being five rounds? Yeah, I, I, I can see that. You know, uh, Pride Fighting Championships has had it a little bit, had like 10-minute round at two five-minute round overtime. The UFC, when I fought the UFC, it was a 15-minute round and two three-minute rounds uh, overtime. So that, that was – when I was fighting for the title. And what year oh, was your... Check, check this out. Here, what give you... me this. This is funny. I'm going to see if you see... You see this bird here? You uh, see the bird? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you see, he took it out of my hand. What do you have? I have a, yeah, I have nuts here. And uh, this bird always uh, comes and they just fly into your hand. And uh, they grab the, the nuts. It's really funny. Look it's Bluey. You. We call him Bluey. Oh, he, he's the same guy? He keeps coming back? Keeps coming back. You love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's when was your when did you you uh, first fight in the UFC? Um, ninety ninety eight. Okay, and that's, and that's yeah. like considered like the wild west of of the UFC, wasn't it? Right towards the beginning. You know, they just took the headbutts out though, so that 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 was good. That, that was a rule I did not like because there were some wrestlers who just took you down. Then they post both hands on your biceps. And then you start the headbutting your face, and yeah, there was uh, you didn't need a lot of technique for that. Once they took that out, it got much better for the people who weren't super great wrestlers. What do you th do you think if you were let's say born 
20 years later, what do you think your uh, your MMA career would have looked like? Would you have got jumped right into like a UFC or Bellator World Series of Fighting right away? Yeah, I, I truly believe so. You know, they always say you're as good as your training partners, right? I had one training partner for 90% of my fights. So one guy. The first year I fought eight fights at no training partner. I trained on the back. That was the only thing I had in Holland. There was nothing there. You know, yeah, in Amsterdam I could train once every month, every three weeks. I would go there for an hour, but that was pretty much it. So now with knowing that, imagine you go back to a place like uh, Extreme Couture or you go Greg Jackson, uh, Jackson Winklejohn, you know, and you train with all the other great fighters, you're only going to become better. Yeah, it, so a guy that, that you fought that I've been a fan of forever, He, I, I went to Ohio State and you fought Kevin Randleman, who unfortunately has passed. But he was all, him and Mark Coleman. It, growing up in Ohio, we always like knew of these guys and knew like, hey, don't ever mess with them. And my one of my coaches was a three-time state champ wrestler in high school and went played football at Ohio State. And he actually used to train a little bit with Mark Coleman, and he would just tell us stories about how every once in a while he'd go over to the wrestling room when Coleman was over there coaching, and him and Randleman were about the same age. My coach. And that I would just love to hear him. He would just tell me stories about those guys. And I know when you fought Randleman, did you, weren't you guys were you friends before? You, I've heard you talk about some interaction you had in in the elevator before the fight. Yeah, no, we were not friends, but we were always friendly. We were already friendly the fight before when I uh, no when he beat Maury Smith. I was there. That was the tournament. It was a four man tournament. I fought Kosaka for the first fight, and I was going I was going to. That winner between Kosaka and me was going to face the winner between Maurice Smith and Kevin Randleman. So uh, when he beat uh, Maurice Smith, I had to go into the cage and we had to stare down. And that became the poster later on. But we already kind of were friendly there. And then that, that interaction, what you talk about in the, in, the, in, the, in the elevator, that was really funny because it was the day before the fight. <clears throat> I'm getting in the elevator. I think we're going down or whatever it is. That he's in the elevator. He's by himself. So um, I go, hey, what's up? Good. I step in, and the elevator closes, and we both look at the wall, uh, at the door, and you see the reflection. You see, and I see he has a smirk on his face, and I go, hey, I wish you all the best tomorrow. And he goes, yeah, you too, man. Thank you. And then suddenly he says, hey, if you promise not to kick me, I promise, and I'm going to take you down. And I go, you're serious, <laughs> you know? He goes, yeah. So then when the fight started. The first thing he does in the fight, he, he starts slapping his thigh, like, kick me. Come on, kick <laughs> me. So now I'm like, I'm confused. <laughs> I go like, oh, you want me to give you a low kick? And what I did there is I faked like I gave him a low kick and I made, switched it to a front kick. I was hoping that he would take the bait. If I make a low kick, that he would shoot in to take me down and I would front kick him in the face. And then I saw him moving backwards. Now my game plan was not to kick at all against the wrestler because if you kick, they'll shoot in and they take you down. So, but when I saw him move backwards on my kicks, I go, hey, wait a minute. He's going back on my kicks, let's kick. And I kicked him and right away he took me down, of course. <laughs> would you, who would you say was, was one of the tougher guys you ever fought? Um, you know, I have to, I always go with Funaki because Funaki, that was the guy, the last guy on the contract. He was the first person to beat me. And that fight was a real tough fight. If you, if you look at that fight, Funaki and Boss Rutten, the second time he fought, I, uh, I came in with this game plan that I was going to let him, I was go, every, every five minutes they announced that five minutes has passed. And I was going to wait till they said 15 minutes because I knew that Funaki never fought more than 15 minutes. He always finished people before that. So I figured if I do that, maybe the, the fact that they announced, hey, 15 minutes passed, it's going to go do something mentally with him. Like, wait a minute, this guy is still hanging in there and I still have 15 minutes to go. So that was the guy to the game plan. But then around 12 minutes, I'm on my knees and he kicks me in the face, which is an illegal thing. I blocked it, but now I'm angry. So that's where I hit him. And he goes down the first time. And that's uh, then it's that's where I started an onslaught on this guy. I mean, it destroyed him. I hit him down. When he wanted to get back up, I hit his back into the mat. I mean, his nose was flat. Both cheekbones was broke. I mean, I broke everything. But the last one was literally I grabbed him by the hair, and I kneed him as hard as his face as I could. And that's when he stayed down. But before that, every time when he went down, people started chanting, Funaki, Funaki. And then the freaking guy gets up again like Terminator, and he starts cheering to the audience like, oh, no, here we go again. So knock him down again. And again, Funaki. And that went on five times. And I'm starting, starting to get tired now. You know, I go, oh, man, I got to finish this guy because we're 15 minutes in. I got 15 minutes more to go. So that's when I grabbed him by the hair. 
and just kneed him in the face as hard as I could. And uh, that's when he stayed down, thankfully. Yeah, that's and you you talk about that when you're doing the commentary of those fights about how much I guess in your early fights how little you knew on the ground and guys would get get you on the ground and you'd say oh man I, I, this is tough to watch watching these mistakes I'm making did that how did you you uh, implement that into your game plan after those first couple fights when you realized you didn't feel as comfortable on the ground? What what happened was is I I didn't have the training partners so uh, after my last loss against Ken Ken Shamrock. I became, I, you know, I'm, I'm a very sore loser. You know, all, all us athletes, we are very sore losers, you know. But that, what's what makes us great, that's what makes us push all the time. Uh, but you play cards with me, I get angry if I lose, you know. So it's now it's it's more because I'm 52 years old. <laughs> I'm more relaxed right now. But I stopped becoming vocal. I went to everybody. Every gym where I came, I would say, hey, is there somebody who wants to fight or train with me here? And I found this one guy, Leon, Leon Van Dyke, who actually became a good fighter as well. He stopped, uh, knocked out Evan Tanner. Uh, who became UFC champion later? So with a front kick to the body, and and he said he was 19 years old, incredibly strong, really good striker already, and we just started rolling. I said, okay, we gotta to hone up on our submission skills, and we start watching fights, videos, instructional videos, and constantly working, working two, three times a day. We switched everything to solely submissions, and that was it. I I never lost a fight anymore. I lo- I I wrapped up my career with 22. Uh, uh, 20, 20 fights that I 22 fights I didn't lose so and, and also and because I, I always mention this because if I can do it other people can do it I always say I'm just a guy you know you guys are also just a guy yeah some people have to work a little bit harder for it but I was doing it all the time all the time if I can do it you can do it uh, the next eight fights that I had so after my last loss against uh, Ken Shamrock and the loss by submission I won my next eight fights by submission so now everybody was confused. They go like, "Oh, wait a minute, what's going on here?" You know, the 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 coolest stats that I uh, read from the UFC Hall of Fame because I, all these stats I had no clue that they were there. Like I'm the most accurate striker still till this day. I had no clue. Uh, but the the coolest one was that they said um, he never attempted a single takedown yet. He won 14 times by way of submission. <laughs> so that means that somebody took me down and then I would reverse him or submit him. And uh, I, w- I was always proud on that. Uh, for that because they always thought I was a, solely a striker but I always tell people hey look at my record I got more submission victories than I have knockouts actually so what do you think of these these new age kids that grow up just as pure mixed martial artists and they're not like wrestlers that had to learn how to strike or, or vice versa yeah so it's scary right now right I mean they're all it's MMA you know you don't have a guy anymore who who excels on the ground of course it's always the you have favorites you know you it's, it's, some guys just like the ground game better than they do the striking. You know, you will always have that. But you see way more fighters now who can finish fights by knockout or by way of submission. And I always enjoy watching fighters like that, like a Carlos Condit. You know, it's like 14 knockouts, 14 submissions, or 15, 15, whatever. It's like equally spread out. And I think as a mixed martial artist, I think that's a, it's a great thing to have because that means you can finish fights wherever the fight goes. What do you think about a guy like uh, Damian Maya who's like, absolute master Brazilian jiu-jitsu but the casual fan kind of they don't understand jiu-jitsu I don't claim to understand it completely but they get almost bored by his fights and maybe he doesn't get the respect that he deserves he doesn't you know the, the, look at his, the, the people he submits yeah. I mean the guys unbelievable I always said if I if I um, if I was still fighting I will be in Brazil with him I will be in Brazil training with him because he on the ground is unbelievable you know he's you, you're gonna you're going to get so much better training with a guy like that. And and the good thing that I like about him is that he says, I want to be like a Horace Gracie. I want to show people that you don't need striking in order to win an MMA fight. And, man, he's doing it. I mean, he's in line for a title. At least he should. Yeah, he's in line. That's the thing. It's almost like I, he, he gets people down and they can't get up. Like the, the best guys in the world, he they just cannot seem to get up. And he's grinding on them all day long, it seems like. And he ends up submitting these guys. And I guess for a casual fan, they just want to. We just want to see you guys stand and bang and, and knock each other out. I guess. Yeah, but I, I think you know. Thankfully, the people start understanding it more now because a lot of them start training, mm-hmm. and they understand. Like for instance, a heel hook or a leg lock. I tapped somebody with a leg lock one time that I came up with an own leg lock. It's a really weird thing. It's where I just push the toes down. But I can literally dislocate his knee. It's like a heel hook again, an inverted heel hook. But I just push the toes down. I had three people maybe in the entire building that were clapping. <laughs> so I pushed, and the guy's like, ah, he's freaking out. 
as like everybody thought it was fake <laughs> because really? it looked really stupid. And I look at the people, I go, well, any of you can come in here. I'll show you how it feels, you know, because you can really do some damage. I can literally reverse your uh, leg like uh, 110 degrees, your lower leg. So that that's not a good thing. You're going to dislocate no. your knee or you're going to break your shin bone or an ankle. It's one of those three. Whatever is the weakest, that's going to give. But, uh, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't look um, impressive, so then they think automatically it's fake. You, you wrestled a little bit. You did some of that pro wrestling, I guess, uh, in in Japan, I believe. Were you ever part of those those weird matches where there's like a fine line, like how much this is set up? Is this is this? Uh, I don't know. They're already a winner, almost like like pro wrestling now in the WWE, but it's sold as a legit fight. No, I ne I was never on that. But the funny story that I have is my very first one. And you have to understand, I come from Pancras, and, and thankfully in Japan they do strong style, they call it, pro wrestling strong style. And that means that they use real submission moves. So there's no drop kicks and no closed lines and all that, so, and, but there's, there's real submission moves, So which makes it, for me, much easier. Pro wrestling here, it's much harder for me. I, should, I have to learn all these crazy moves that, you know, not really are moves, if you think about it. But that, with the strong style, there were real moves. So you can just ad lib during the fight. Now, the way they set a fight up is like you go to a place, to a warehouse in this van, and they blacked out the windows. It's very secretive. And you go into this place where you train with your opponent that you've got to face. You you work on the begin part, then you ad lib a little bit in between the middle part, and then the, 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 after that you ad lib a little again, and then you go home, as they call it, go home, and that's the wrap up, you know, that's the knockout. So the, the script, was that he would, the fight goes, he's the number two from the organization. So I fight the number two of the organization, 55,000 people in the building, Don Fry is in my corner. And I already told him, I said, what if they hit me for real? Because I don't know what they say to each other. Maybe they go, they say, hey, watch this tonight. With Boss Wooten, he thinks he's a, he's a tough guy, this uh, UFC fighter. I'm going to hit him for real. Watch me. So all that goes through your head. So he was supposed to throw me in the corner. I would hang in the rope. And then he would give me an elbow. And he gave me another elbow, and then he uh, would wild it up for the rile it up for the whole people, and then he would drop me with the third elbow. So the first elbow is perfectly timed, but the second one is a full-on hit, like boom, and I go, I, I feel it. So my automatic reflex jumps in, and I go boom, and the guy goes, up. and he's out, and he, this is this is 20 seconds into the fight. <laughs> He's on the ground, his eyes are open, and Don Fry is in the corner like this. He goes, oh, dude, you did it. <laughs> and the referee doesn't know what he's doing, so he, he walks around him. And he, while he walked around one time, he goes, one. And then he walks around him, two. You know, So he gave him like half a minute to recoup. And at eight, he started flinching again. He got back up, and we finished the fight. But after that fight, boy, let me tell you, they were all afraid. Before the fight, they would come to me. And they would say, please, you know, could you not hit for real? I said, it's very simple. You don't hit me, I don't hit you. Those are the rules, right? If you nail me, I'm going to nail you back. I don't know if he does it on purpose or not. So it was a, it was a fun experience. I had a lot of fun time there with all the Steiner brothers. And, uh, and China was at the time with us. You know, she, she's passed away, unfortunately. She was, she was something, man. She was so funny always. But all, meeting all these pro wrestlers, it was a, it was a good time. Did you ever do anything with the WWE, or I guess it might have been WWF back then? You know, there was, there was this thing. I almost signed with them. There was the foreign power we were calling our, ourselves. It was Marco Huas, Oleg Taktarov, and myself. So Russia, Brazil, and the Netherlands, they would go in as the cult the foreign power, and they would go uh, do pro wrestling. But then my daughter was born. My, my, uh, my youngest daughter was born. I already missed the birth of the other one. I missed so many... Uh, Oh, no, I missed her birth already. And then I said, you know what? Uh, when I found out that I couldn't get away with 20 shows a year, but it should, it, they asked for over 200 shows a year. Man. 200 shows a year without traveling. It was a really good contract. Money-wise, I really needed it, and it would have helped me a lot. But you know what? I, I already missed her birth, and I go, you know, I'm, I'm going to miss I'm gonna miss the most important years from my daughter. I'm not going to do it. So uh, I declined at that time. Oh, that reminds me of the, an Instagram post you just had, I think, yesterday. You posted a, a note your daughter had written you when she was 13 years old. 
you, did you but you did you read it because a lot of people nobody reacted to the line oh i read it i i show I, I no joke i showed my wife and my wife she's like she could care less i'm into all this like i'm into mma did all this stuff and she she was never never look at anything and i was like hey here i'm talking to boss here this afternoon check this out and she actually laughed because you said thank you for what for helping me with the crazy bitches that's it you're the first guy who says that and i go like gosh you did not read that line you know, you help me stand up uh, for when bitches are getting different. <laughs> and I go, yeah, that's my daughter. <laughs> I love it because I have a I have a six year old daughter now, and my wife and I talk every day. We're like, honest, I, I my wife especially, she's like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Like if I if she comes across these catty like jealous girls that want to be mean to her just because of the way she dresses or the way she looks, my wife's like, I'm gonna have a hard time not freaking out on these kids and their parents. And so I showed you know her what? that. I, I, what I told him is, it's, it sounds really horrible. It is horrible, but I told him, I said, if you get into a fight, I said, because both my girls are very pretty little blonde girls, and uh, and you wouldn't expect anything from them. I said, I want you to headbutt them in the face as hard as you can, and then just start hitting till they don't move anymore. <laughs> I said, if you do that, the visual that you put out there for everybody who's watching. From that moment on, they will call you the crazy bitch. And that means you will never fight again in that school because everybody's going to be afraid of you. And you go, okay, daddy, that's what I'm going to do if it happens. Thankfully, it never happened. Oh, man. how? So how old is she now, your youngest? My youngest is 16, just turned 16 last week. Yeah, St. Patrick's Day. Wow. Okay. So she wow. drives a car now. It's crazy. Do they uh, are any are they in? Do you train them at all in any kind of uh, mixed martial arts? No, they know, you know, if I take the focus mitts up and I, I let them do all the combinations, they know all the combinations. They will do that. And I wish that they would do more because, um, yeah, it's it, for, for a girl, it's very important, I, I, I believe. But uh, no, they're okay. They, uh, I know how to do an armbar. That's yeah. what they say. That's all. Okay. Be the aggressor. <laughs> I like that advice you gave her. Head butter and keep punching until they pull you off. I, I learned that on the football field when guys guys will get in fight i don't know if you've ever seen it on film it's it's a joke you watch two guys in full pads their helmets and everything getting in fights and punching each other in practice and they're punching with closed fists i'm like you guys need to watch some pancreas with your open fist you always need you definitely need to to have open fists if you're punching a helmet but no matter what you, you guys would fight dudes that are 350 pounds if you just started throwing volume punches right off the bat you're not going to get jacked like and they're going to come break it up and you're going to at least get six or seven shots in on the guy so i was always like i always told guys if a big dude's coming after you just go out just be the aggressor you just start it don't wait for him to, to blast you because if he, he could hit you once in the temple and you're going down so just start throwing a million punches a mile every second and you're you're going to figure out you're going to be okay you know, it's what I would say in, in this particular case, if they wear a helmet and, and even the packing, a clothesline. But a clothesline, I, 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 do, I put it on my uh, Facebook account. If I give a clothesline to a bag, uh -huh. the bag will fold around my arm. It is such a powerful weapon. And what you're doing is you loop it behind the neck. So you loop it forward like that. And you go behind the neck. And what it does, it goes behind the helmet and it hits the back of your head here. Oh. It's still a legal oh. shot, still outside. But trust me, his equilibrium will not be ready for that. And he will go down with one shot. Just hit as hard as you can. And with a helmet, oh, man. I always, if I, if I have the story, here, the word helmet, I got to tell this story. So my, my ex-wife and I, we broke up. I got my new wife. And we're driving around. But my, my ex-wife had this uh, niece who had a really bad boyfriend, very abusive, you know, he hit her and they broke up. And, and I told the, the girl, I said, okay, we, you know, we, we don't go along. Um, you, 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 your aunt and I don't go along, but if you ever have problem again with that guy, you're all, you can always call me. So out of the blue, suddenly she calls me and she goes, oh my God, he's in my house. And he comes here. So I go, okay, I'll be right there because I was driving around with my girlfriend, which is now my wife. <laughs> so we go to the place and she had a, it, it was an apartment, but I knew that there was like a, a, a rotating uh, stairs going down. And I figured, you know what? He probably has his motorcycle because he's a motorcyclist. He probably has it downstairs. So he probably, if he knows that I'm coming, he will escape through that, uh, to that stairs. And um, so I went to the stairs and yes, he came walking down. And while he came walking down, he already was loading up. He wanted to hit me, but he's an idiot. You know, he runs forward doing this. So I gave him a front kick, and he flies back on the stairs, and he jumps back up, and he had his visor. It was open, right? And I go, bah! 
fuck? And I swear to God, I hit him exactly in between the thing, and he went out. And I look at my wife, I go, did you see that? I just straight through the helmet. I had like half an inch on the top and half an inch on the bottom, and I perfectly went in there. That's my, I love that story. Beautiful knockout, precision punching. Oh, who doesn't? That's why you're so accurate. That's why you're in the UFC Hall of Fame. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I should what... tie that together. That's a good one. Yeah, Dana should have put that up on the stats when you got inducted. If you'd known that story. How old was this kid? Uh, 25 at the time. Okay. He was an older guy. Okay. Yeah, he was an older guy. He was just an, uh, it's just an abusive guy. I think it's from an abusive family. You know, most of the time it transfers open, uh, over. I don't know why that is. Because I, I never got that. If, if kids get beaten up by the parents, you know, did you like that? No, you didn't like it. So why do you do it to your kids? You know, I don't. I never get that logic. But hey, apparently that's how it goes. Yeah. Did, were you always like that? As a uh, even when you were a kid growing up, or were you um, were you a guy that wasn't scared to get in a fight if you needed to, or to protect a friend? I did. You know, I was the kid with. A, I had a horrible skin disease. I had skin disease in my hands, in my face, in my neck, and. I had a severe asthma, so um, an asthma attack, eight days in bed, not able to eat because I couldn't breathe, you know, <clears throat> 24 hours a day. Wow. Um, so I was skinny, and I had to wear gloves and turtlenecks and long sleeves, and needless to say, I was always bullied. Uh, a Bruce Lee movie, Enter the Dragon, actually made me change and started training, and then I knocked out the biggest bully in town, and from that moment on, I became the... The, the bully beater, so to say. So if I see, saw other kids having problems with bullies, I would just beat the crap out of those bullies, you know. I had a reason to fight. Wow, yeah, that's something. That, how was that, especially living in California? I know it's pretty uh, liberal out there. How have you seen that, like, culture now compared to when you grew up with, it seems like everyone you, is so politically correct and you're not, I don't just, do you think kids need that violence? Do you think there needs to be bullying for people to figure out where their place is? Yeah. I truly believe so. I think, uh, you know, this is bad when I say spanking your kid. I'm a believer. I never did it to my kids, but I believe in it. I'm not talking smack, smack him in the face. I'm not talking about that. But a kid is already afraid if you just do this out of the butt. You know, hey, don't do that anymore. They go, oh, they, they freak out. You're not hurting this kid. But nowadays you can't do anything anymore. There's a whole BS thing with the transgender rooms. and There's nothing you can do anymore. It's very simple. You have a penis, you go to the boy section. And you have a vagina, you go to the girl section. That's what you're doing. Then later in life, if you get or if you get the operation, well, then then you can go to the other place. But to have an extra door for that, for that one person that is there, you know, learn to live with it for that moment. I know it's hard. But I mean, come on. It's so now, now yesterday was in the news where somebody got um, the parents were going to sue somebody because this boy was uh, changing. And this girl who's a transgender was in the same room and staring at him. And now the boys went to the, 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 the mom and dad start suing the school, you know, because because they didn't want that transgender thing to happen at that school. It's, it's just this weird thing. You can't say anything anymore. Everybody is a winner, right? If you do a contest, they all get a freaking trophy. You know, try to do that with math, I always say. Go to math, and then, uh, and then I say, hey, my daughter was last. Yeah, I said, no, 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 it's not working. She's gonna, she, you're going to let her pass. Why? I said, well, they do it in PE. Why don't they do it here? I mean, if you do it with PE, why won't you do it with here? You know, it makes no sense. They set kids up for failure. That's what happens nowadays. There's no goals. If you lose, that means you're going to have to work harder in order to become better. That's how you learn. If you fall, that's how you learn to walk again, right? You burn yourself and then uh, you see a fire as a kid. Oh, you burn. Oh, don't do that again. That's how you learn, you know? Let kids be kids and make them understand that what you can do and can do. Yeah, have you seen? Have you had any issues come up uh, in that transition coming over from Holland to now with your kids? Have you had any like had to go speak to the principal because dad wasn't being PC enough, or you felt like uh, you, things weren't handled the way you you liked them to be? No, thankfully I never had that. The only thing that I had, I went to an, a karate school here for my kids because I figured I'm going to put them in karate. You know, so there's a little bit of a structure. And now in Holland and in Europe, the structure with karate is. If you if you don't know your katas, you're not going to get your yellow belt. Here, it's a different story. Here, everybody gets their belt. It's just a money-making machine. People have kids are waiting in line on the block. My kids never, I saw them never practice at home their katas or the, the, the two-step sparring things that they needed to do for karate, and they let them pass. 
They let him pass. And I, I went to the teacher. I said, this is the dumbest thing. I said, I'm sorry. We're out of here. I mean, you let everybody pass. They don't know what they're doing. Why would you let these guys pass? And it's because that, that's why you have these parents that come to you. How many times you say, oh, yeah, my, my son is a third degree black belt. Yeah, but he doesn't know how to kick and how to punch. So <laughs> well, you spend a lot of money for nothing. You put him in an MMA class. The guy's going to get butchered. It's, it's sad, but it's true. Yeah, is that? Do you have any like? Have you had had any like formal like jujitsu training, or is all your stuff submission? All submission. I, I uh, in Holland, we were way behind. You see, still now the Dutch guys are not really good with the submissions. They're really great strikers, uh, the best in the world. Like literally, they, these guys went to Thailand and beat the Thais over there. So they they're the best guys. The K1 Championship, which is the biggest organization on the planet, glory. You know, it's always a Dutch guy. That wins. I mean, for for the last 20 years, maybe two times not, but the rest it's all Dutch. So the striking is really good, but the submission isn't, and and that's why we started changing. My buddy and I, we just learned from watching fights, and then see if you can make things better. You see a heel hook, and you go like, wait a minute, if you do it like that, I can escape. I can do this, and now I'm out. Okay, so how can you stop that? So we start brainwashing about every little detail, and you know sometimes you can't make it better, but many times. You can make it even better, uh, at least better for you. So it, 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 it fits better for your personal style, you know, and I want people to do that. I tell my students all the time, I say, experiment, guys. Yeah, listen to me, but you got to do your own stuff as well, because that's when you get creative. Are you aware of, uh, are you a fan of Joe Schilling, the kickboxer? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, he's freaking great. He's, he's So Joe actually, grew, he grew up, uh, we went to the same elementary school for a little while, and then Joe moved out to California. So he when he burst on the scene, I was like, man, Joe Schilling. And I, I've talked to him a little bit over the last couple of years. I, I couldn't believe at how skilled he was. And I'm wondering, like, when when is kickboxing going to catch on? Do you, do you see it kind of catching on mainstream in America? You know, that's the, the sad thing, because <clears throat> if there is an exciting sport, martial art out there, it's kickboxing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you watch Glory Kickboxing, is the best kickboxers on the planet. And, I mean, 80% knockout ratio from all the fights. I mean, what is not to love? You see the highest skill. There you see really skilled striker strike. And it's easy to understand. People who are booing at MMA events, well, they should watch kickboxing, right? Mm -hmm. It's an awesome sport. I wish that it... Uh, more people would watch it. It uh, really deserves it. It does. And Joe, you talk about a guy that's exciting to watch. Watch Joe Schilling fight. My buddy, who I, one of my best friends growing up, will text back and forth during Joe's fights. Joe throws so many punches; it's unbelievable that he can keep up the pace. And he's such a skill. He's just skilled all around. The fights are so exciting. He'll, either he's going to knock the dude out, or he's going to get caught after he's been throwing haymakers all night. And then, bam, he gets caught. But then he gets back up and he, he comes back and he'll fight again another day. But it's it's truly is it's so exciting the action they have. I don't but I don't know. So many people are not aware that it's even going on. I feel like. Yeah, I have no clue why that is. It's uh, it's weird. I always thought about uh, making a kickbox organization. Uh, they have it, I believe, in New Zealand now um, with MMA gloves, because now when they l let MMA be legal with the gloves, well, that means that you can do it in kickboxing as well. You know, no, I don't know if it's a healthy thing to do in kickboxing, but it's uh, <laughs> it, uh, that, and we'll get some attention. I guarantee you that people would watch. Oh yeah, Chuck Norris had a league like that uh, a while back, didn't he? No, there was more kicks, right? There was that whole very uh, beautiful kick. We had a few uh, fighters coming out of that. They were really uh, incredible strikers, like the the spinning back kicks they did. I think it, maybe even uh, Michael Venom Page, he might have been in that organization. I don't know for sure, but that guy's also, he's a freak. He's really very accurate with his striking. Yeah, I remember watching yeah. it a, a little bit. Oh. What, what's your new deal you got going on, the Boss Rootin' Experiment? I just watched the, the first episode, or I guess it was the trailer for it. I don't know which what it, what it was. It's an uh, it, it's it's an, just an, uh, a funny, these are six-minute videos that we do with Boss trying and coming up with crazy ideas for a show. So uh, I want to sell boss diapers. Boss diapers? What are boss diapers? You know that? I believe it's in the second episode. It's going to come out next week. Now people are going to go, that's a stupid idea. But I guarantee you, once I start talking to you, you're going to go like, well, actually, <laughs> that is not such a bad idea because you, you can do a lot with that. And then, of course, we, 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 we make it funny as well. But the other things, I can do my own sports show, I think, my own new show. And then I can do, I start knitting somewhere. Or, and then I'm cooking. You know, I have all these crazy ideas that I want to bring back to life and see if uh, some stick. And, of course, 
none of them uh, none of them do well my favorite was but, is by far the the boss rooting uh your protection deal they set security or whatever you run around the house but then the guy's with his girlfriend and you pop up and like pull out and she said you bring protection and you pop up to pull out it's funny right? pull out now yeah that was i wasn't i was not expecting that actually you surprised me we uh the first one, I said, you know, let me do it really matter of fact. You know, so they go, oh, oh, and I go, pull out now. You know, like, just do that. And it was really funny, but I don't think it's the people who get it. So they used the bigger one that I'm screaming like a swatch, and I go, pull out now. <laughs> you know, like, it's almost like that. <laughs> oh, it was awesome. Now, uh, just a few more for you, and, I, and I'll let you go on your way. But what about, I always wondered, when you were fighting back in Pancreas, what was the, the testing, like the steroid testing protocol like? Well, there was none, and and if you look Not, at like nothing effects, at all, you could actually tell. You know, there were these guys who were like 250. Do you know there was just giant people there? We had a the strongest man, one of the strongest men, August Schmiesel came in, it's <laughs> a freaking monster. You know, so no, there was uh, there was no testing there. Jeez, were were people trying to to push push you to to take the juice? No, I I never did, and and. Um, I, I'm I'm really that guy um, that if I would look at my I'm, I'm a looking at the mirror guy. That's what I always say to everybody. I can look in the mirror myself in the eye and I can say I won my titles myself. I never cheated. I never did that. And and that's a good thing for me to know because for me I am the most important person. You know I don't want to lie to myself because if I lie to myself I lie to the most important person. The last person you should be lying to is yourself. You know, you got, as a fighter and, or as an athlete, for you, the same thing. you got to put yourself at the number one spot. And now I know other fighters, they will say, um, no, you know, I fight for my family. I fight. For, I say, no, once you start fighting for your family, that's when the nerves come in. Because then you start, you, you're, you're also, uh, you, you're caring about what other people say about you. You should not care about anything. Put yourself at the number one spot. And if you do that, your family automatically will be taken care of much better because you will perform much better with no pressure. Like with fighters that are very nervous. What I say to these fighters, I say, imagine your opponent. You're going to have to face that opponent tonight. Well, what we're going to do is this. We put you in a room. We close the door. And you guys fight. And when you come out, you're not allowed to say who won or lost. Would you care if you would lose? And they all everybody will say, no, I wouldn't care. I say, you see what you're saying right now. The only reason that you don't want to lose is because your family and friends are uh, sitting there. That's the reason you don't want to lose. If somebody's just better than you, you know, if you give everything you have, uh, you left everything in the ring or in the cage, you can never be to uh, be blamed for being a, not a fighter. You left everything out there. That guy was just better at that moment. But it's the backlash that you get from all the people. You see, I always said he couldn't fight. Oh, he could have done this. He could have done that. Yet all these people are not fighting. They talk about you, but they're not fighting themselves. So I think once you can step away from that, and that's how I triggered my brain, I said, you know what? I'm not going to care about anything. I had the people in Holland, and that's probably the reason. I lost one fight. I beat everybody by knockout in Thai boxing, and then I won. I lost the last fight, but it was also my fault. I was in jail two days before because of helping out a buddy whose face got beat in. So we went to those guys, but then the police came, they loaded us up, and I should have never fought a fight, but I, I did fight the fight, and I lost. And the backlash I got after one loss, it was insane. So at that moment, I said, you know what? I'm not going to fight for people anymore. I'm going to fight for myself. I think I will do much better. And that that was the magic the magic spell, I guess, whatever you want to call it. That uh, From that moment on, I became a much better fighter. Why do you think so many athletes do lie to themselves then? Uh, I don't know. I think it's a, it's an insecurity. I think once you grab to, to performing enhancing drugs, you're already not happy with yourself. You're not happy with the person you are, you know, because you think you need more. They all blame it either on weight or on the other guy was probably using more. It's not about that. Look, go all the way back with Helio Gracie. I mean, the guy was this skinny, and look what he did. He was folding people up left and right. It's not about, look at Hoyce Gracie. He fought much bigger guys. He was folding these guys up. It's not because one guy is 10 pounds heavier. I would be ashamed. If I would be, uh, I, I never did. I did one time a weight class because I, I was actually the first UFC heavyweight champion uh, because that's where they start making uh, classes, heavyweight and middleweight. I think they believe 200 pounds and under, 200 pounds and over. I was actually too light. 
to do my title fight. I literally had to weigh in, so I had to drink waters to go over 200 pounds, and that's when I was allowed to have a title fight. So I, I don't look at weight. If, if I would, for instance, would fight at 205, and my opponent is 207, I would say, uh, instead of telling him, oh, I want him to lose the two pounds, you know, I would say, keep him. Keep the two pounds. I don't care. I don't need any money. You're going to need those two pounds. Trust me, because I'm in shape. I think that me, that statement to that fighter will do way more mentally than saying, oh, yeah, no, 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 you got to take the two pounds off. Because if I say you have to take the two pounds off, I'm scared. Mm -hmm. Why am I scared? Why does he need the two pounds? What's this two pounds going to do? Two pounds is not going to do anything. You know, so fighters, it's either or he use steroids or he cuts more weight. So many times when you see a fighter losing, then they start cutting to another weight class because it's not their fault. It's not technical wise. They're, they're good. It's just because the upper, other opponent cuts more weight. You see, they never put the blame on themselves. I always been the guy who says, I got to get simply get better, you know, and if I get better, well, then they can't beat me anymore. Even if they're 20 pounds heavier, it shouldn't matter. You know, don't complain about 10, 15 pounds. It's, it's stupid. Why are we seeing so many guys uh, miss weight right now, in the UFC at least? Well, it's because they took out the IVs now, right? Uh, so the, 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 normally, if you have a hard, hard weight cut and you know that there's going to be IV bags waiting for you afterwards, it's a little easier to push through, I assume, you know, because that's, you know, at least the end, the end goal is to make the weight and then right away get the IV bags. And now they took the IV bags away, you know, I think it's that mental thing. It's It's harder to to cross and they all want to cut the weight. I always say fight at your normal weight because keep your body happy. The one thing that you don't want to lose is the water. The water is the most important thing in your body. <clears throat> with with dehydration, you also dehydrate the, the brain fluids, you know, and they're there for a reason. They're the, the how you say it, the, the, the buffers, so to say, so it doesn't bounce up to your skull. That's why that fluid is in your brain. And if you start dehydrating yourself, that's when accidents happen. If you hear from uh, Habib Nurmagomedov like two weeks ago against Tony Ferguson, you know, he went to the hospital. And they go like, oh, I don't know. I said, a guy like Habib Nurmagomedov who wrestled with a freaking bear when he was 12 years old, <laughs> this guy from Russia, I guarantee you that something is really, really wrong if he decides to go to the hospital. And when you heard Dana White, they said, yeah, his kidneys almost shut down. He could have died. The guy could have died. You know, I say, fight the weight class up. It's 15 pounds. Who cares? You're going to feel happy. You can eat whatever you want to eat. You know, so a happy body, a happy brain fights much better than a stressed out piece of body. Do you think, do you think, do you think that's the reason why a guy like Dan Henderson was able to fight for so long? Because he never, he says he, he never really had to cut weight. I know he even spoke of he had to gain a few pounds to get up to 205 to fight heavyweight a couple times. Then, then is the same mindset as you see with all us. It's like there's the, the older guys. The he he cares about his body being happy. Dan knows what he can do. He can knock out heavyweights with his hands, and he knows that, and he trusts that. So he doesn't care about weight. So yeah, Dan. I always said Dan is a man's man. Every guy <laughs> likes Dan because he's a tough guy. Yeah, he is. All right, boss. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I wanted to tell you also, you were great in Here Comes the Boom. I know you have a lot of different acting gigs you've been on, but that movie, you were really good as the trainer. And you and Kevin James, you got him in fighting shape, it looked like, too. You know, he's he was unbelievable, man. He lost 82 pounds for that movie. Jeez. It was insane. He trained like a real fighter every day up at six, running, do all the ways, do the training, you know, his, his hand speed. I mean, at the end, because people, they started laughing, some people in the in the movie theater, when he lifts up Christoph Szynski and when he slams him down and then he's out, right? At last, and when they shot that, that particular take, they brought in a crane with a rope because it needs to be in slow motion. It needs to, they need a good, uh, a, a good piece of video on it. So what Kevin did, he, because all the extras were there, there were like 150 people around us. And he says, can I have everybody's attention? He says, because I know what people are going to say, you know, so let me get this out of the way. So he goes down into the guard of Christoph Szynski. I said, put me in an armbar. Christoph puts him in an armbar. He lifts him up above his head, puts him down. Then he lifts him up above his head, puts him down. And he lifts him up above his head, puts him down. And he looked at everybody and said, did you guys see me doing it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Now we're going to bring in the cable. But you know that I can do this for real. And I'm so happy he did that. Because with the movie, so many people said, yeah, but you could tell, you know, it was like a rope and it's not possible. I said, well, I actually did it three times in a row. So, yes, it is possible. That's good. All right. Well, boss, thank you so much for your time. Where would you like people to, to check you out and find you on all your different uh, channels and everything? 
Well, Facebook.com uh, slash Bas Rutten is my Facebook account. And go to, if you want to see that video, the experiment, go to champions.co. So not com, co, dot co. Uh, to that website, and there you will see the episode of the Bas Rutten experiment. And the next one is going to be released next Wednesday or Tuesday, Tuesday, I think. All right, great. Yeah, we'll, we'll link that up when we post this episode. But thanks a lot, Boss. And then hopefully we'll talk to you down the road. One more thing, yeah. the Rutan and Ronello show, Rutan and Ronello show. That's our podcast with Mauro Ronello and myself. Check that out as well. You're going to love it. We have two podcasts, one about fighting and the other one is about life, just having a lot of fun. They're both great. Believe me, I, you guys are, are great when you two go on Joe Rogan's podcast as well. So thanks yeah, uh, thanks fun. again, and we will uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, my friend. All you right. take care. See you, boss. Godspeed. We're glad you could join us for today's conversation. After you subscribe to the show, head over to thehawkcast.com or reach out to AJ directly on Twitter at OfficialAJHawk to recommend future guests that will help us inspire people to keep talking. Thanks again, and we look forward to speaking with you next time on The Hawkcast.